Hello and welcome to the environmental episode of the International Society of Explosive Engineers web series Explosives Every Day, which looks at how explosives are used in a wide range of applications. I'm Alistair Torrance, President of the ISWE. Our organisation started in 1974 when a group of like-minded people got together in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to discuss how to better apply commercial explosives and how to champion the blaster in the field. Move forward to today and we are an international organisation with more than 4,000 members spread over 90 countries with a mission to advance the science and art of explosive engineering worldwide. We do this through sharing our knowledge and providing training and education for everyone involved with blasting. We also have a strong education foundation and have awarded more than $1 million in scholarships to our students in our industry. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our series partners, Dyna Nobel, Opit Blast and LDE Global. This series would not have been possible without their tremendous support. During this episode, we'll see how explosives are used to improve our environment and how they are managed. Our Explosives in the Environment session sponsor is Bar Engineering. And here's a little bit of information about them. Bar Engineering Company integrates engineering and environmental expertise to help clients develop, manage, process, and restore natural resources across North America and around the world. For more than 55 years, Bar staff has supported environmentally friendly energy, water, and mining projects through engineering design, permitting, planning, construction, and operational support. With offices across North America, Bar's explosives engineers support blasting related projects through innovative blast design, comprehensive monitoring, and consulting services to blasters, project owners, and governmental and regulatory agencies. This episode's presenters are Kristen Colden of Alasma Seismic, Jerry Wallace of Wallace Technical Blasting, and Carl Perry of Missouri S&T. Kristen is president of Alaska Seismic, and environmental, and she specializes in consulting and monitoring services for land and water-based blasting projects. She has been a member of the ICE for 15 years and is currently on the board of directors. Kristen will describe how blasting projects are designed to minimize and mitigate impacts to fish, wildlife and their habitats. She will discuss projects that use explosives to enhance natural habitat. Jerry has been a blasting contractor since 1992 and a licensed blaster for over 40 years. He's also a past president of the ISWE. Jerry will discuss blasting at two downs and two wells. So Kyle Perry is an associate professor of explosive engineering at Missouri S&T. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in civil engineering from the University of Missouri and his doctorate from the University of Kentucky. He's a professional engineer and a licensed blaster in Missouri. Kyle's story involves a beaver dam. Beavers were threatening the integrity of a levee of a several acre pond which was uphill of a residence. The pond spillway pipe was constantly being plugged by beavers, leading to a rising pond waters which were starting to overflow. When the beavers were removed from the pond, their den was destroyed to discourage a return. It's going to be a question and answer session with the presenters right after this presentation. The panel will discuss many questions that were asked by a live audience at the time of this episode's first airing. I'm going to speak about blasting for water to protect and uh, distribute water resources. In general, when we blast, we're always paying a mind to keeping blasting residues out of the groundwater. It's part of our everyday challenge as a blaster. But what I'm going to talk about is blasting to protect 
particularly to protect the resource and for distribution of water resources. We'll note water is a life critical resource. Blasting to protect and improve water resources. Mark Twain is the one that is uh, commonly used as the originator of the phrase from the American West. Whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. Now there have been fights over water in the Arkansas River since 1902. And one of the projects I'm gonna talk on is a follow on from that decision. And that decision on the Arkansas River water is what established the Supreme Court as the place for arguments between states to be litigated. Water is big in the current news. You got Flint, Michigan, where you have criminal charges against politicians for their failure to protect the public from uh, pollutants in the water. You have California that's in a three-year drought and terrible wildfires. You have Istanbul, Turkey, which is the largest city in Europe, 15 plus million people, and they're running dangerously low on water. So water is absolutely critical. So what I'm going to discuss here is how careful blasting on four challenging projects was required to move them forward. The first project, two of them are at dams. One was inside a water reservoir to depths of 60 meters to make it possible to install new valves, given that the valves installed in 1905 when it was constructed were failing. And this was the water, main water reservoir for the city of Denver, where over 1 million residents were at risk of losing their primary potable water source. When they constructed the dam, they hadn't given thought to repairing the valves and so there was no way to shut the water off so that they could repair the failing valves. So what we had to do was use a dive crew to go down with specially built drilling equipment and drill a very critical pattern that we then designed individual charges and used electronic detonators to fire and open up the intake, the upstream side, so, so you put spindles in and install New, then new, new valves were installed. And it took very high degree of attention to detail and very skilled young emergency professionals handling the electronic detonators to make this job a success. The uh, second project gets back to the 192 Kansas versus Colorado water issue on, where the uh, amount of water taken out of the Arkansas River in Colorado meant that there was not enough water for commerce downriver. And the, the outcome of that was that they were, there were requirements to build storage reservoirs on the upper part of the river and a certain minimum amount of water spilled at all times so the commerce on the lower river could continue. That started in 1902 and continued on with dams built up into the 1980s. And finally, someone realized that this water they were spilling from one of the dams could go right through a turbine 100 meters downriver from the dam and then back into the river without changing the amount of flow. So that took a 12 or 15 years of litigation. And finally, we were given the okay to put the hydroelectric turbines in. It was a challenging project that even though it was in wide open space, it was decent train to work from. It did have a challenging foundation design and a challenging work environment. It was the foundation design was challenging in that it had three different turbines going in. They were three different sizes and there were 18 elevation changes and it poured the solid foundation. It was a challenging geology because there was a, a lignite layer that became an issue when we were told that we had to be very careful with our blasting, but they couldn't tell us why. And we discovered and finally uh, the word came around that this, lit this uh, lignite layer was so critical to the, the integrity of the dam that they were very concerned about vibration on it. So we had to work through it very carefully 
and take it a step at a time, again, using electronic detonators and uh, young emergency professionals running, running the uh, blasting to end up getting the turbines successfully installed. That takes care of our work around dams. The last two projects that I'm going to talk about are decommissioning water wells. The first I'll talk about was a domestic water well that we did just in April of this year in Bellevue, Washington, where they were constructing two huge high rises for Amazon. And the second was a, a water well at an industrial plant that was being decommissioned. So we jumped to the one on Bellevue. It was over a thousand feet deep, supposedly plugged years ago when it was abandoned, domestic water user. And uh, when they started excavating down and cutting the pipe off, they found that the uh, there'd been some, I guess you'd say, misleading statements made about it being a, properly sealed off and abandoned. There was only about five feet of concrete up in the top of it. As they go down on this 90 foot foundation, they have an open well that goes clear down into the aqua. Environmental protection people were not happy that they'd been lied to early on and they, they required it to be abandoned by being perforated and pressure grouted properly, starting from the ground up or the bottom up. And when you're dealing with depths of over a thousand feet, over 300 meters, you're looking at very few explosives that can reliably detonate at that depth. So I worked with one of the oil well perforation companies to get the proper charges to use at the depth. And we started working our way up and out. What was absolutely critical to our success was that we had access to the 1946 drill log, which showed the elevations that they had perforated for inflow of water and the elevations between those uh, perforations that, that we had to put in perforations with our blasting. So having a good drill log is absolutely critical information. The final job that I did, and this has been over 20 years ago, was where they, they were taking out an industrial plant. And again, they had a well that had to be abandoned. And on that one, they had started going down to mechanically perforate it. And they got down a certain way, ways at 50 meters, and there was a flaw in the pipe. And the pipe broke, and they uh, had all their recovery and perforation tools stuck down there. So they attempted to overdrill it to get below it, to pull it out, and they got down to a certain depth, and they couldn't go any further. So it turned out the option was to shoot a pipe off inside another pipe without damaging the outer pipe. And that, again, took some thinking through. I worked with especially explosives manufacturing company that actually built the charges for separating the, the uh, space rocket pieces and came up with a design. It's got a shape charge inside, so it's going to go down inside the large pipe and in, in, uh, it has a bicycle inner tube inside it to inflate so you have it shooting through air and it'll be properly centered. You have airlines and two detonator leads on it. And you can see in how we put it together, went down properly, cut it off, and retrieved the tool. Um, it, so basically, we were able to be successful by thinking through and designing the solutions, particularly to a real challenge. So basically, there are four successful pro projects that I talked about here where we use blasting for good environmental purposes. A domestic water source was repaired for another century of use. Turbines were installed, generating electricity using water that'll continue down the river for navigation. Critical foundation work during COVID-19 moved forward while protecting the aquifer. And then the industrial plant cleanup was completed after salvaging tools. Hello and welcome to my Dam Beavers presentation. My name is Dr. Kyle Perry and I'm an Associate Professor of Explosive Engineering at Missouri S&T. The situation was that with this was uh, 
a private landowner owned a 2.5 acre pond, roughly. And it was held, all the water was held in place by a long levee. So the water would run down the watershed into this pond. And if it rained too much, the water would go through a spillway and down, down the hill and away from any potential damage. But the problem was in the middle of this pond was a beaver den and beavers hate the sound of running water. So they would be constantly plugging this, this spillway pipe and large rain events, the water would actually go above the spillway pipe and actually start going over the levee. And the landowner, landowner was pretty worried. He was thinking, you know, if this levee fails, I'm gonna be in big trouble because my neighbor is right down the hill. And if this big influx of water comes down, um, there's gonna be some serious situation and, and safety concerns down with this house. Uh, we have the pond and a levee holding water. Then the water level gets up to a certain level. It goes through the spillway pipe and goes gra gradually drains that pond a little bit to keep it at the right level. And this this per, this landowner's neighbor, the house shown in the picture, was basically right down down the hill from this from this pond. So if if this spillway pipe kept getting plugged and plugged and plugged to where water couldn't run through it, the potential risk was water overflowing the levee, weakening the levee, and eventually the entire levee might fail, releasing the entire pond down toward this house. So the beavers. Uh, the beavers had a den kind of in the middle of the pond. Uh, there was a, an old tree that was dead out in the middle and they had, you know, taken branches from off the shore and brought them in, built a dam and whenever it would rain, they would constantly hear this water running and I think it just drove them insane. So they would, you know, pick up mud sticks and everything and jam it into this pipe to where the water would stop flowing through it. And the landowner was angry, the neighbor downhill was fearful for his property and I would be too if that levee gives way, there's gonna be a big problem so the solution to this was make sure the beaver stopped plugging this spillway. So luckily in Missouri, we do have a beaver season. Um, whenever this whole kind of project kicked off, had a meeting with, uh, with the landowner and kind of told him, you know, this is, uh, this is environmentally sensitive. We don't want to go out there and blow up a bunch of beaver beavers with explosives or harm them anyway. So, you need to work with your uh, game warden in the Department of Conservation to make sure you remove these beavers um, in the proper and legal way. So he did that over, over this time and come early spring, everything was good to go. He said, it's all clear, he went out and looked, didn't see any evidence of beavers, but to kind of discourage a a repopulation of a new group of beavers that could just come in from some other pond and say, hey, there's already a house built for us. We wanted to remove that beaver den. And as I mentioned, since it was in the middle of the pond, there was no way to get any kind of mechanical equipment out there to it. Therefore, um, explosives were chosen. And the cool thing about this was I was teaching the advanced blasting class at the time and we had a few students in the class and they were still around wanting to do something you know a little bit different and this was a very unique application for explosives so we could kind of treat it as a training exercise and educational purposes for these students so in order to load the explosives we actually loaded up um, a couple boxes um, of dynamite and emulsion onto a little john boat and two of us rode out the uh, with a rowboat basically to order or out there to uh, to see where we should put the explosives, what the, the best plan of attack would be. So when we got out there, we got out and we were able to walk around on, on, on the den. Uh, we didn't go over the exact middle for fear of it kind of caving in, but around the perimeter, we were fine. We weren't getting too wet. And we, we found out that we were able uh, with our wooden loading poles, we were able to kind of poke down holes into the perimeter of this beaver den. And, you know, it's made up of sticks and mud and we were able to get a, a big enough hole kind of reamed out to be able to stick down um, dynamite as our primer and then emulsion on top of it. So we loaded, loaded all those holes up, um, got a starter cap on it, ran the lead in line out back to the levee and then hooked up a, a 
remote firing system so that we could be a, a good distance away from, from the shot when it, when it was going to go. Because it's not every day you blow up a beaver den and, and, and every one of them is different, so you don't know exactly where, where things are going to go. But the good thing was the house was really far away. Uh, the landowner's house was really far away and the, the residents down the hill kind of had a had some trees and a forest between the house and the pond and, and wasn't we weren't fearful of things flying and hitting any any houses. So with that, the here's a video showing uh, the explosion. The I have a GoPro set up actually on the levee. So the house would be directly behind uh, the camera down the hill. If you look, uh, the beaver den is located right here. So that's where you're gonna be looking when this video is running. So it took care, took care of it very nicely. This is this video is going to run back and, and be a little bit uh, kind of a slow motion view of it as well. So we were standing probably half a mile away. Um, where we can still view this and see it. And, you know, we estimate that the, the debris and everything was 100, 150 feet in the air. It shot it up pretty good. But as the smoke clears, the good thing is the beaver den is gone. So the results of the shot, the den was definitely <laughs> eliminated. Uh, no new beavers have come back to the site to to repopulate or build a new den or anything like that. So they haven't had any spillway issues. The, ha the neighbors have been happy. We alleviated an environmental concern of potential levee damage by rising waters in that pond. And kind of the, the last key aspect of this was, you know, we got to do something new with the students, show them unique ways to use explosives to help uh, not only our environment, but also humans and, and the way they live. When blasting in remote and sensitive areas, special care is taken to avoid, minimize, and mitigate negative effects on the environment. Blasts are designed to limit ground vibration, air overpressure, underwater overpressure, and fly rock. The type and degree of impacts are dependent on many factors, including geology, site characteristics, blast design, explosives confinement, and many others. More importantly, environmental impacts depend on the proximity of blasting to sensitive environments or fish and wildlife. Before drilling and blasting can begin, Project stakeholders and resource managers thoroughly review proposed work and identify sensitive species and habitats that may be impacted. Determining the exact amount of excess noise or vibration that will disturb or harm a species is a difficult task as few studies have been performed and much of the relevant literature is dated. Mitigation techniques and methods are often required when blasting impacts are unavoidable. Methods can include performing work at a time when fish or wildlife are not present at the site, physically removing species from the affected area, hazing or deterring wildlife from entering the area, or applying barriers or buffers to reduce off-site vibrations and pressures. In some areas, explosives are used to enhance natural habitats. In Southeast Alaska, salmon are a vital food source for local human and wildlife populations. After spending several years feeding and growing at sea, mature salmon return to freshwater streams where they were born to reproduce. After spawning, adult salmon die and their carcasses provide a rich nutrient input into coastal ecosystems. During their upstream migration, adult salmon swim through river currents and navigate waterfalls in search of available spawning habitat. 
The strongest swimmers are able to utilize pools and other stream features to gain momentum to jump and swim over obstacles such as waterfalls. Local fisheries and land managers identified this particular remote series of falls to be a partial barrier to migrating salmon. Creating a larger jump pool at the bottom of the falls would give salmon a better chance of making it past the falls to additional river and lake habitat. Blasting was, ex was selected as the least impactful method of deepening the jump pool located in the middle of a 956,000 acre wilderness area with no roads or trails. Federally designated wilderness areas prohibit the use of most power equipment and machinery. For this project, special permission was granted for the use of gas-powered drill breakers. All equipment, supplies, and personnel were mobilized by float plane or foot. Prior to blasting, several hydrophones and geophones were set up at various distances to ensure compliance with these conditions as well as to provide a research opportunity. Other mitigation and research efforts included trapping and removing as many fish as possible from the immediate area. Juvenile fish were trapped from other locations and placed in cages with hydrophones to study the physical effects of underwater overpressures. All drilling and prep work was performed by hand over a two-day period. Blast design included small diameter closely spaced holes to expand the jump pool and pre-split holes to shear the base of the existing waterfall. Pounds per delay were limited to ensure compliance with pressure and vibration limits. Fish were removed from the area with cast nets, dip nets, snagging rods, divers, and traps. A temporary net weir was installed downstream of the blast area. A number of small juvenile fish were placed in cages near hydrophones as well as at a control location. Underwater overpressures and in gravel ground vibration recorded during the blast were within acceptable levels. All caged fish survived and were held for an observation period after the blast. All appeared uninjured and behaved similarly to control fish caged outside of the blast area. Unfortunately, it was not possible to remove all fish from the site prior to blasting. 17 injured and one dead fish were caught in the downstream weir and examined post-blast. Surveys and counts conducted in the following years confirmed that a much higher percentage of salmon were able to reach the upper creek and lake area. Project timing, blast design, pressure and vibration monitoring, and fish removal are all examples of minimizing the effects of blasting on the environment. While not all impacts were eliminated, resource managers weighed the short-term effects of blasting in a delicate river ecosystem versus the long-term benefit of increasing salmon abundance. A question and answer session with moderator Travis David Saber, ISE board member and Emerging Professionals section chairperson begins now. So take it away, Travis. All right, thanks again, Alistair. And uh, again, without our sponsors, this free series wouldn't be possible. Let's talk now with our panelists, Kristen, who is in Alaska, Jerry in Washington, and Kyle in Missouri, who are all ready for your questions. Please send any of your questions in via the question and answer box. And our first question here is for Jerry. Uh, Jerry, why did the old water wells need to be perforated before plugging? The, the concern was for the pollutants to get into the aquifers that uh, would then be able to get out to other people's domestic water wells. So we perforated them so they could get grout out surrounding the pipe into any voids that were around the pipe as well as inside the pipe to keep any of the pollutants from going down. And this was steel casing that needed to be perforated, Jerry? Yes, it was. We perforated the steel casing and that took a, quite a bit of design work to make sure we had charges that would fire through the casing and, um, and make a hole of a proper diameter to allow the grout through. And, you know, it's all, it's all in the math. You get the proper thickness, you send it, we send it off to the manufacturer of the charges and they build a test charge, fired it, made sure it would work and documented that for us. So that we, since obviously if you fire one and then start grouting out, you can't send a camber down to make sure the grout's outside the pipe. So uh, you have to do the testing ahead of time and document that. Great, thanks, Jerry. Um, Kyle, our next question is for you here. 
And the question is, was there a vibration concern, a vibration concern or any other concerns regarding vibration to watch for relative to the levy and making sure it wasn't damaged? No, that's a good question. You know, one of the things that we thought about was that in trying to adhere to Missouri scale distance laws, uh, Missouri sets it at, at 55 for any kind of blasting. And we were only using around two or three pounds per delay. So in that and being that the levee was around 100 feet or so from the dam, we were within that limp, that, that scale distance limit. And that limit only would, should produce around 0.4 or so inches per second. And I'm pretty confident that, that that levy could take a lot more than that. So yeah, we considered it, but with just using such small charges at a relatively you know good distance from it, we weren't too concerned about it. All right, thanks, Kyle. Yep. Our next question is for Kristen. Uh, Kristen, what is the standard for underwater blasting, especially in relates how it relates to the impacts on uh, water animals? And what kind of explosives do you typically use for this type of blasting? Well, hey everyone, thanks for the question. Um, it actually depends on where you're blasting because there are so many different species of fish and marine mammals that are in the water. So in each area that you blast, a uh, project usually goes through a review and regulators will determine what type of species are present, if they're endangered and what type of levels we could impact them. So for example, in Alaska where I typically blast, we have different species of salmon that are in the river at different times. And they have one pressure level and one vibration level for their eggs that they actually lay in the stream. Um, and when we blast in harbors, we have to worry about marine mammals like seals and humpback whales and porpoise. So it really depends on what the species is, but there are a lot of different levels out there. And that's something that we're trying to get a better hold of in our industry. Sure, and Kristen, in following up with that question, this question is actually coming from one of our associates in Indonesia who's a member of the Indonesia Blasting Engineer Society. Uh, they asked the first half the question and the second half here as well. Um, how do you measure underwater blasting impacts? Again, it depends on what the regulations are. So if you're looking for an underwater overpressure or an in-ground vibration, like for example, a salmon egg that was laid into a stream gravel, um, you use a different type of instrumentation, but what we typically use would be um, a hydrophone that would measure underwater overpressures. And then um, you can use a a type of a waterproof potted geophone to measure uh, ground vibration in the stream gravels. Thanks, Kristen. Um, our next question is back to Jerry. Um, how deep uh, underwater can you reliably shoot electronic and electric blasting caps? The, the really deep ones, we used uh, detonating cord to carry the initiation signal from down below the surface a ways from a detonator. So we never exceeded ten, uh, seven bar of pressure on our detonators, even though we're shooting under 25 to 35 bar at depth, but the uh, high quality detonating cord transmits it all the way down. But we would put the detonator well down in the wellhead, especially in the city there, so that we wouldn't have air over pressure issues there with all the neighbors and the workers. All right, uh, this is a question for all of you on the panel. Um, the statement starts, we've used blasting to reshape some areas to reestablish grazing. Have you ever seen any similar explosive applications to reestablish properties? Well, this is Jerry. We, we reshape property all the time for civil construction projects, uh, housing developments, shopping centers, the whole works. And it, yeah. as far as up here, it's used typically for, um, I mean, as far as habitat enhancement goes, we're blasting jump pools or removing blockages to open up more upstream habitat for salmon. So we do use it quite a bit for habitat enhancement. Yeah, and you know, my colleagues here on the panel do a lot more worldwide type environmental projects than I do, but I know we try to be a, a good neighbor to our community here and try to help out um, other people in the area. So an example would be uh, one of our neighbors near the mine uh, wants to put in a new geothermal greenhouse to, you know, grow plants and things like that. And so I'm having my advanced blasting class this semester blast out an area over at his, over at his property, which is real close to the mine. So it's good for us, good for him, helping the neighbors and, and being, being a good neighbor. So. All right. Our next question is again for all the panel. 
Uh, what do you think will be the next environmental challenge for the explosives industry? I, I would say that we are facing our next environmental challenges. And um, Jerry, I'm sure you would agree with this, but you know, working different places, even just around North America, there are different challenges in every, every place we go. Some states and some agencies are more in tune with one issue versus another. So we encounter a lot of different issues that some, are, some seem like they're in the past and some are gonna be in the future. Two of the issues we look at all the time are perchlorates, usually prohibited for use around waterways, and then nitrates in general getting, if you don't get a proper detonation and you have waste nitrates getting into the groundwater and the soil are the issues that we're faced with. And we're working on that on a regular basis. Uh, I'd even throw in air, you know, more and more push of not having those orange clouds out on the big shots going any toward any neighbors. Well, this next question, I think, goes directly to that point. It's more specific. Um, uh, this question is, is for all of you, but were there no effects of the explosive residue in the quality of the water, or how were those effects mitigated? In the blasting I did, we used molecular explosives that had the oxygen balance, so they were uh, by all accounts, totally consumed when they detonated with only generating steam would be the, the uh, leftover. And that's why we chose them for that purpose. I would agree with Jerry, um, similar to the projects that I've worked on. Um, also, in some of these situations, you're working with an area that has a high water input and flowing currents. So um, if there were any concerns, you would likely see them flushed out. Um, another question for all of you. Um, I've heard that air curtains can be used to protect fish and um, marine and uh, aquatic habitat. How do these work and do you, how do you test them? Oh, I've used them on a couple projects. And what you do is if there's a math formula and the, the best answer would be to ask Corey Goomans, but because he's done all the research on them. But what you do is you take a major airline, usually an old uh, bull hose, and you put a certain size of holes a certain diameter, and you encircle your blast zone with them. And prior to blasting, you chase your fish out of that critical area, and you turn on your bubble curtain, and that keeps the fish from crossing it. And it also attenuates about 90% of, of the water overpressures. And if you put a double bu dual bubble curtain in, then you get 99%. Um, when you shoot bridge piers, they're fairly common to use. Uh, other times you just use a scare tactic to get them out, but bubble curtains do work. And uh, the SEE has had papers presented. Corey Goomans wrote a, a good study on it about a decade or so ago. And, and I usually like to tell people to call Jerry and ask him. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important to note that bubble curtains aren't effective in all situations. If you have a situation where you have a highly tidal area or river, any kind of water current, bubble curtains are not nearly as effective. Because if you can imagine something sitting at the bottom of, of a water body, as those bubbles rise up, if you've got a current, they, they suddenly go away and they're not doing the job that they're intended to do. So it works in some situations, but it's not applicable to all. It's not a panacea that solves all your problems. Right. Uh, our next question again is for all of you, and it is uh, really what technology changes have each of you enjoyed and embraced the most over the years? <laughs> there, there's been quite a few. Um, man. I think the thing that I've enjoyed the most is the uh, wireless, um, being able to initiate a, a shot wirelessly, being able to get off at a safe distance, not have to be hunkered in and be tethered to the shot. Getting far enough away, you can put eyes on it, make sure it's safe before you push the button and, and things go off. And, and from my perspective, doing a lot of in-water work, I would say by far the sampling and monitoring equipment has improved greatly over the years. And a lot of the old regulations that you see that have been carried on um, throughout federal and state agencies 
are based on research that was done back in an age when we weren't able to sample as fast. So you could sample hundreds to maybe low thousands of samples per second if you were looking at underwater overpressures. Now we're able to go upwards to near a million samples per second. And so that's, that's pretty amazing. And we're able to actually capture true peaks and frequencies and other aspects uh, in the water. And we can look at what actually affects different species. So we're definitely making improvements in the monitoring equipment. One that jumps out at me is being able to put the blaster back in charge of the shot and shot timing by elect use of electronic detonators. Notwithstanding, they do have limitations very close in the you have to be aware of. They give you the ability to set your shot off your different delays at the time that is needed, given the situation and the geology and everything else. And with Kyle, it, you can set them off at distance. But electronic detonators are just a great tool, great new tool. And uh, coupled with Kristen's monitoring instruments, we can do some pretty nice work. Yeah. All right. Our next question is again for all of our panelists. Uh, there's a lot of math involved in your explosives applications. What else do interested folks need to bring to the job? A willing to work. Uh, a good afraid, attitude. <laughs> yeah, not afraid to get dirty and uh, willing to learn. Have an open mind, take in all the, the knowledge that you're getting from your, your coworkers, from the driller that's been there for 30 years, that if you're new on the job, he knows a lot more than you, even though you think you know a lot. Keep your ears open and listen. Whoa. Sorry about that. Automatic lights went off. All right. The ability to, to uh, adjust to the situation at hand and being able to think on your feet is absolutely critical to work in the blast industry. Um, our, we have a couple, a couple questions here and then we'll be out of time for a question and answer session. Um, do you see more eco-friendly explosives being developed in the future? I'm sorry, I didn't test that one, Travis. Well, do you see more economically friendly explosives being developed in the future? Well, it would be nice if I could buy explosives for less money, but uh, I'll have to pass that on to the, our, our scientist professor. <laughs> uh, he said eco-friendly, not economically friendly. <laughs> oh, okay. I like Jerry's answer. <laughs> You know, I, I always hear rumblings about it and people experimenting with different things, but, you know, I haven't heard much coming down the, the pipeline as far as, you know, big production type things and selling it. All right. Um, this question is similar to the uh, question that was asked in the previous session. How do you explain to someone that explosives are inherently safe for, an, for our environment? Inherently safe for our environment? Yeah. Uh, at, at times they are the best option and that's that's where we are we're always working to improve it but at times i've been called in to clean up messes where blasting was prohibited and it caused bigger problems by their failures mechanically and other means than it did to blast it properly to start with all right well, I think that's about time here for our question and answer session. I really appreciate all of you that are online for joining us this evening, this morning, today, wherever, I guess, whatever time it is, wherever you're at in the world. We have folks on from all around the globe. And again, I appreciate you joining us. I want to say a special thanks to, to Kristen and Jerry and Kyle for helping put this session together and providing some great conversation about how we use explosives in our environment, how we manage explosive use uh, to protect our environment. Um, now let's take it back to Alistair with some uh, news on upcoming events in our industry. Thanks, everyone. So thanks, Travis, and thank you for watching this episode of the ISEE Explosives Everyday Series. Explosives are the ultimate power tool that help mine the minerals and materials that are used in creating many of the products and roadways we use each and every day. They help keep our towns and cities safe from avalanches. They are used to shape and improve the environment and also military and demolition applications. And they're in some of our favorite TV shows, movies, sporting events, and concerts. 
Our job as professionals in the explosive industry and at the ICE is to ensure explosives continue to be handled and applied in the safest way possible and to continue to provide the resources and tools needed to help advance the science and art of explosive engineering. If you're interested in finding out more about the International Society of Explosive Engineers, please go to our website, ISEE.org. You'll find information about membership, our chapters around the world and other useful links, including a calendar of upcoming events, as well as conferences and meetings in our industry. Another great resource is the World of Explosives, where you can find information on using explosives safely, the most frequently asked questions from homeowners about blasting, how blast vibrations affect structures, and all the planning that goes into each blast. It's also home to Explosives the Power Tool, this is a video series covering the history of explosives and the technical advancements that have been made possible because of it. To check it out, visit explosives.org. Once again, a special thank you to this episode's sponsors. LDE Global, Dynanobel, Opit Blast, Fire Engineering, DNA Blast Group, and to all our sponsors throughout this series. Before we go, here are a few short words from one of our series partners, Opit Blast. Five, four, three, two, one. From now on, your blast designs will be perfect. Opit Blast presents the best blast design software simulator. Securely store all your projects created in the Opit Blast in the Opit Cloud, allowing staff to access all the information using the Opit app, Opit Dev. The best value for money on the world market. The definitive solution for measuring borehole deviations in quarries and mines. Efficient for 360 degree measurements. Opit Blast. With us, it's possible. Hello, Anna. How are you? Hi, Lewis. I'm preparing my next blast, but I've got some issues with a few calculations and some of the analysis. Of course, don't worry. Let me introduce you to my friends from the DNA Blast Group and their technology, which is based on the real parameters coming into play in blast design. Brilliant. That's it. Based on the DNA Blast technology, they developed the iBlast software, in which over 40 real parameters come into play to analyze the mine blast. And what are its functionalities? With iBlast, in addition to designing your surface and underground blasts, you can calculate and make advanced simulations in order to control vibration, fragmentation, fly rock, and the area wave. It's all in one. You mean that with iBlast, I don't need any other software? That's right. You can calculate, simulate, and optimize with one single software package. And even better, you can do all that with one single database. Can it do 3D calculations? Even better than that, iBlast can make 4D calculations. What do you mean in 4D? Look, let me show you. It's called 4D because in addition to the positioning, we can use a variable time scale. You can contact them for any service whatsoever for the simulation and optimization of customized blasts, be it for open cast mining or underground. They work throughout the whole world, which enables them to be on the cutting edge of innovation. They have offices in France, Ireland, Russia, the USA, Mexico, Peru, Br Brazil, and Bolivia. So that's it for this episode of Explosives Every Day. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn pages to stay up to date with all the latest ISE happenings. And be sure to check out all 10 of our episodes highlighting the different ways explosives are used around the world every day. On behalf of the ISEE, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.